I want you to hit me as hard as you can. begin a new year of awfully good movies by talking about a filmmaker who has made a huge comeback ever since his last appearance on the awfully good radar by the name of M. Night Shyamalan, whose latest flick serves as a sequel to not just his psychological horror flick Split, but also his cult classic superhero flick Unbreakable, as the many voices of James McAvoy meet up in a mental hospital alongside the unbreakable Bruce Willis and the very much breakable Samuel L. Jackson in Glass. And while the critics may have thought this was an underwhelming sequel, it's solid box office opening is definitely a great achievement for the career of Bruce Willis, who has not had a great track record with sequels lately. But long before we saw Bruce returning to the Unbreakable universe, we were hearing him return behind the microphone once again as the voice of the telepathically wisecracking baby Mikey in the 1990 comedy sequel, Look Who's Talking Too. Three years before we saw the Look Who's Talking series descend into a pile of Danny DeVito dog shit, the second film of the franchise was still based around the original film's gimmick of having Bruce Willis' comedic commentary dubbing over the inner thoughts of a newborn baby boy named Mikey, as the infant observes the blossoming romance between his single mother, played by Kirstie Alley, and a cab driver, played by John Travolta. And only one year after that flick's huge success in the box office, writer-director Amy Heckerling was forced by TriStar Pictures to immediately crank out a sequel that would not only reunite John Travolta and Kirstie Alley with the voice of Bruce Willis, but also bring in Roseanne Barr as the voice of Mikey's newborn baby sister, back in a more innocent time when Roseanne Barr was still allowed within the vicinity of a family comedy. But despite the addition of the domestic goddess to its voice cast, the Look Who's Talking sequel did not even come close to its predecessor's runaway success at the box office, and also failed to impress the critics, which of course led to the third installment dropping the baby gimmick altogether. And while I may not have been a fan of that final chapter of this trilogy, I shall give a watch to the second installment to find out whether it is, in fact, worth talking about. Plus, if I'd want to see Bruce Willis providing the voice of a talking dog, then I can just go watch another third installment from another talking baby movie franchise instead. Don't go and be fooled by those fancy pants. It's just her feline. And thank God that movie was theatrically presented in Odorama because it really helped the audiences find out how much Bruce Willis' singing voice stinks! But first, let us fill up our nippled baby balls with whiskey to prepare ourselves for another round of the awfully good drinking game. Because this movie gets insane right from the opening TriStar Pictures logo. Oh, Wilbur, here I go! <laughs> I'm running pretty good now, and I'm gonna take a jump, and oh, I got wings and I'm flying! I'm a new one, like a TriStar Pictures, where anything can happen. And yes, that was Bruce Willis doing that Mr. Ed impression. Just in case TriStar wants to bring him back to the franchise later on for Look Who's Talking Nay! <laughs> but for now, Bruce is once again providing the inner voice of the adorable baby boy, Mikey Ubriaco as we open the film with little Mikey lying awake in bed out of fear of the monsters he thinks are hiding out in his bedroom. Oh my god! Monsters! Oh shit! What the hell? Nobody told me that this franchise was crossing over with the Puppet Master universe! Alright, I'll do it, okay? Thankfully, Mikey's new stepdad, James, comes in to calm his baby boy's nerves, while he and his new wife, Molly, are in the other room, planning to conceive themselves a new baby that will not have the stink of George Seagal all over it this time. So cue another wacky title sequence that graphically portrays Travolta's sperm making its way into Kirstie Alley's uterus. Let me in, baby. Let me in. Gonna let her in. Yeah. Which begins forming a baby girl with the voice of Roseanne Barr. Well, here I am, all conceived and nowhere to go. Even though the end credits stinger from the last movie clearly promised us this baby girl would be voiced in the sequel by Joan Rivers. Don't start with me, kid. I've had a day you wouldn't believe. Hopefully we'll sell this confusion when Sony finally decides to make Look Who's Talking into the babyverse. But as the two parents prepare for their new daughter, they still have to worry about teaching their one-year-old son how to use the potty through the power of song. Come along and be my potty boy. My girl likes to potty all the time. Potty. Oh. You got to fight for your right to potty. potty. Kick it! After all, the Beastie Boys were well known for laying their bowel movements. Mm -hmm. 
DROP! And while James continues to work as a New York City cab driver, Molly is trying to juggle her newfound motherhood with her high stakes job as an accountant for the IRS. What's that? What's up, my man? What the hell is a kid doing in Mr. here? This Russell, is an office, not a nursery. Somebody's loud and opinionated. And somebody's looking like the creepy Twilight CGI baby crossed over with the American Sniper fake baby. As brought to you by the same special effects artist who did David Cronenberg's The Fly. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when you get your head caught in your placenta? And after Mikey's mom tells her son he's going to be a big brother, he fantasizes in bed that night about becoming a loving and caring big brother for his future baby sister. Hey, punk, get your own toy. All right, that's it. I'll rip your lungs out. Give it to me. Hey, what are you smiling at? Boy, I knew that this new Die Hard prequel was going to be a bad idea, but I seriously doubt that John McClane was fighting criminal scumbags even when he was just a fucking baby. I'll rip your lungs out, motherfucker. Soon we find ourselves fast forwarding nine months to find the fully pregnant Molly finally going into labor in the middle of an argumentative business meeting and cue another repeat of a gag from the last movie. Uncle Ernie was an idiot. It was a stupid idea and they lost their shirts so just so loud the fucking deduction. Fuck my breathing. What a lovely singing voice you must have. And although tragedy strikes when the baby begins to choke on her umbilical cord during the delivery, with Dr. Tom Green nowhere to be found to save this child's life, that's when a quick cesarean operation from the doctors helps save the newborn life of little Julie Ubriaco. Hey, you look a lot better from the outside. I'll take her now. Where am I going? Where are you taking her? Uh, don't worry, ma'am. We're just taking Roseanne's character out of this movie early so we can save ourselves a whole lot of trouble. Here, have a baby with the voice of John Goodman instead. John Shabbos! And not only does the sequel introduce Roseanne as the voice of Mikey's newborn baby sister, but it also adds a dash of in living color to the cast by bringing in Bruce's future Last Boy Scout co star Damon Wayans as the voice of Mikey's best friend Eddie. You know, I'm wearing the trading pants, man. Who was originally announced in the film's teaser trailer to be voiced by Richard Pryor. Oh, I heard that song before, pal. But got replaced after a behind the scenes altercation with the TriStar Pictures horse. Wait, whoa! Fucking Wayne's. What's going on? Fucking white horse! Anything can happen. And Eddie is here to warn his baby buddy about the hidden conspiracy behind his parents' toilet training. Yo, we have to, Mike, because the toilet man says so. Who? Mr. Toilet Man. He likes to eat your doodle and your pee pee. So I say, give it to him. Oh, no need to explain. That Lifetime documentary told me everything I need to know about Mr. Toilet Man. I'm joking, of course. The role of Mikey's imaginary toilet monster is actually voiced here by the one and only Mel Brooks. Hey, you, you little bitcher. I'm talking to you. Oh, no, what is that? Give me some pee pee. Where's that pee pee? Stop talking about pee pee here. You better give me that pee pee. Give it to me. Trip, trip, trip. <laughs> And ironically enough, the little kids who watch this movie will also now be having nightmares about Mr. Toilet Man. The next time you sit on me, I'm gonna bite off your cushion! Yes! Meanwhile, on the adult side of the family, Molly is seeking the help of her nagging mother, played here yet again by Olympia Dukakis, to use her connections at the airport so that her taxi driving son-in-law can get a more financially stable job as a private airplane pilot, seeing as Jimmy Ubriaco and John Travolta happen to have a secret passion for flying airplanes. I'm coming home. But instead of being thankful to his wife, James feels emasculated that his wife has taken a dominant role in managing their newfound family. My parents are okay separately, but as a couple, they stink. Why don't you just put me in a fucking dress. Hey, Tracy, hey, baby, look at me. <laughs> and things sour even further between the two lovebirds when who should move into the apartment but Molly's deadbeat brother, Stuart, played by Elias Codius, who needs to stay at his sister's place while he's on the lookout for a new job. He's yep. the accountant for Mitsubishi. Not anymore. I hate these damn Orientals, man. They're buying up this whole damn country. Whoa there, Casey Jones. Just because you got replaced in Ninja Turtles 2, by that surf ninjas guy does not give you permission to insult him as an oriental. <laughs> but when James comes to discover his brother-in-law is a paranoid gun-toting maniac, he tells Molly he no longer wants her brother in the same house as their two infant children. If I drink out of a styrofoam cup, you give me a two-hour lecture. But, but, but Travis Bickle moves in with us with a semi-automatic weapon, and, and it's okay. And trust me, Travolta's character isn't simply making this Travis Bickle comparison simply because he happens to be a fellow taxi driver. But what do you think's gonna happen when the shit really hits the fan, huh? Earthquakes or, or, or flash floods. Like, just a lot of chaos and horror, people die in the streets. Someday a real rain will come and wash all this scum off the streets. Now, one of the things that still holds up rewatching the first Look Who's Talking is the charming chemistry between Travolta and Kirstie Alley. 
which does occasionally shine through now and again in both of these shitty sequels. But in the case of Look Who's Talking 2, these two characters are forced to bicker and bitch at each other for most of the movie, simply because Kirstie Alley refuses to admit her brother is a racist psycho who shouldn't be hanging around her two infant children, and things boil over to the point of them finally separating from each other. I'm not gonna kick him out. So you just get out of here! Elvis is leaving the building! Chase my daddy away, I'll show you a thing or two here. All the yelling and screaming all the time. Where's what I think of your little friend here? Oh, no! Bye-bye, no! birdie. You are my friend. <laughs> and as for the voices of the two kids in the film, Bruce Willis does get to showcase some of his trademark comedic charm, even when he's given these terrible one-liners and forced to sing to his penis. When you have to pee, you jump up and down, but sometimes nothing has to come out. But as for Roseanne, she does not get much to do here as Mikey's baby sister. That doesn't involve her screaming and crying at the top of her lungs with that eternally annoying voice of hers. <laughs> Will this pain ever go away? Here's a toy you can play with a Nerf ball. What a one Plus, Amy Heckerling has admitted in a recent interview that she only did a Look Who's Talking sequel because TriStar Pictures legally forced her to. And her contempt behind the camera is obvious when you're watching John Travolta break out some truly dad joke level celebrity impressions. Why you have all the things I'll take that gummy and I'll knock him from here to Kingdom Come? Do we? Ha! <laughs> well, what would Arnold say if he were here? He'd say, do it. Why don't you do it? You are here. Do it. Also, why are we plugging a far better TriStar movie from 1990 in the middle of this terrible movie? You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here, Hauser. Look who's talking. And while I'll admit Travolta does try now and again to add dimension to his one-dimensional character, the best performance of the movie actually comes from none other than Gilbert Gottfried in the role of Joey the Baby Gym Instructor. And God bless Gilbert Gottfried for improv some hilariously inappropriate jokes around these little kids. Don't forget to breathe, because a lot of times people just drop dead here, and you say, hey, it's what happened. I forgot to breathe. Need circle, some help? Indians dance in okay. a circle. Help me. Jews and Italians all My dance kids. in circles. And after Gilbert joins John Travolta for a white people as fuck dance number with these little kids to the tune of Elvis Presley's All Shook Up, uh, I'm all shook up. Molly is inexplicably convinced to give her husband another chance, which reunites the family all back together just in time to watch little Mikey finally take a shit inside of Mel Brooks's mouth. You don't win friends with salad. You don't win friends with salad. And while the first look who's talking does not hold up as a timeless classic upon rewatching it nowadays, it was at least a fresh subversive spin on the romantic comedy formula which spotlighted Amy Heckerling's considerable talents for hip and socially satirical comedy. And where that third movie went insane with the dramatic plot threads in the last 30 minutes of the movie, the second film goes utterly bananas within the last 15 minutes, when Molly is worried about her husband trying to take his plane up in the the air in the middle of a massive hurricane hitting over the country. But it's pouring out. Well, you know what they say, it's better to be up in the air pouring than it is on the ground on highway cars. Wait, I'm pretty sure nobody in the history of civilization has ever once used that expression. Is that an L. Ron Hubbard quote? Well, you know what they say. They talk a lot, don't they? And while Molly takes a taxi to her husband's airport in the middle of a massive hurricane, just so she can plead with him not to fly his plane up in the middle of a massive hurricane. Didn't you listen to the news? Honey, the news always upsets you. Only for the two of them to find out his flight has been canceled because of the massive hurricane, Molly's brother has been asked to babysit her kids until she gets back, when Stuart gets preoccupied with finding a burglar breaking into their bedroom. And while Stuart chases after the would-be burglar in the pouring rain so he can throw his ass into the garbage disposal alongside Shredder, Mikey and Julie are left to fend for themselves in the apartment while it catches on fucking fire. Okay, stay calm, stay calm. Just get Uncle Stuart. Uncle Stuart! Uncle Stuart! Oh, great! Oops. If only Gilbert Gottfried was still around in this movie so he could teach these babies how to be cool about fire safety. I hate smoke. It's disgusting. So whenever I see it or smell it, I make this noise to warn you. So 
while Look Who's Talking To may be a half ass sequel to a movie which was not asking for a sequel, it is not without some guilty pleasures over its scant 80 minute length. Yes! And who knows, if we finally can get Bruce Willis back for an unbreakable sequel, then perhaps he may one day come back to play the grown-up Mikey in a Look Who's Talking reboot, where he and John Travolta could return to enlist the services of their old pal Quentin Tarantino. Oh, Mikey, what do you want? You want a pizza? Ah! I'm gonna bite off your tushy! Ah! Look Who's Talking. Never again. <laughs> Anything can happen. And on the Christmas related theme song watch, I am sad to report that this Look Who's Talking sequel will not include any Christmas related theme songs as performed by a white French baby rapper. But much like the original movie, this flick still does have a legitimately good soundtrack that manages to afford not only two Elvis songs and a George Harrison song, but even a John Lennon song. I was dreaming. Yes, because when the nation was in mourning over the tragic death of John Lennon 10 years before this movie, the hope we had all shared was that Mr. Lennon's music would continue to live on into the future so that it could further promote world peace, as well as provide the soundtrack to a talking baby comedy co-starring an animatronic toilet monster who drinks infant piss and speaks with the voice of Academy Award winning screenwriter Mel fucking Brooks. And the world You're supposed to give me some baby! Where's that baby? We're talking about baby here! On the enjoyable discontinuum scale from Bola Bruce, Look Who's Talking To is about as good as you'd expect from a sequel that couldn't even bring back Abe Vigoda or Charles Barkley. I think I broke my ass. That's terrible. And changes its diapers into a 5 out of 10. Indeed, how can the same shit happen to the same baby twice? Die Hard Quotes! I'm Jesse Shade for Joblo.com, and I'm glad to report that Joblo.com has just made a deal with Sony Pictures to help distribute all these boxes of unsold Look Who's Talking t-shirts. Now available in children's sizes, adult sizes, and our brand new John Travolta sizes. Yes! To get your Look Who's Talking t-shirts and sweatshirts, call 1-800-538-2000 and use your credit card. Or send check or money order to LWT Shirt Offer, PO Box 239, Bellwood, Illinois 60104. Include three 50 postage and handling at a dollar for each additional item. Offer expires October 31st, 1990. Cool commercial, huh? Rewind it and watch it again. We'll wait. Day. Okay, enjoy the movie.